We've had the incredible upheaval of a global pandemic. We've had bushfires, we've had floods, we've had climate change and all its impacts and that will continue. We have now the, the impacts of the war in, in the Ukraine. The, the world does feel like an unpredictable and risky place right now, doesn't it? But this is where I think solid research can really help us make sense of what's going on. Q, our fantastic researchers, our risky women, all part of Victoria University's Risk, Disaster and Resilience Network. Technology has increased the risk and it's made it more complex because technology gives us the ability to be so much more widespread and, and reach so many more people. Social risk underpins everything. It's We, we call it the carbon monoxide risk because it doesn't it sneaks up on you and you don't really see it till you're feeling the symptoms and it's a really dangerous risk it sits underneath all the other risks and amplifies them I don't think 20 years ago I would have thought that democracy was at risk as a, a form of political organisation. But what we're seeing now is actually a substantive threat to the actual rules-based order. When it comes to built environment, when you talk about health and well-being, it's not necessarily just the quality of the um, indoor environment, but actually goes a lot beyond that definition. And we are talking about human rights, equity, and community resilience. Whilst the disruption is all about risk, the, you have to flip that at some point and make it about a therapeutic approach, which is all about needs and strengths. When I think about kids and, and, and lighting fires, you know, it's a problem that can have se severe consequences for them as individuals, their families and the broader community. We actually disengage people from violence. We don't de-radicalise. It's really about meaningful engagement somewhere else. How do we distinguish between what's, you know, developmentally typical fire interest and, and some fire play and uh, from ones that are more problematic and may need some psychological intervention to target some underlying mental health health concerns that might be contributing to their behaviour. I have moved away from the mainstream engineering more into that built environment area and that's really because of that human focus I would say and we do see a lot of um, designs around us that are not very inviting and they don't look very safe and uh, I'm a strong believer that we need to work collaboratively we need to make those places more inviting um, a safer more human uh, more human definitely. Celeste Young you have, in a sense, embedded yourself closely with the East Gippsland community as part of your recent research, who had survived really the most horrendous fires in the history of record keeping. It made me realise we're actually measuring the wrong things because communities put much, much more store in things like kindness, their local knowledge, generosity. And I thought, well, surely if those are the things that are the glue that hold them together, if those start to disappear, that should be the warning signals for us when they stop being kind to each other, when they stop being generous. That tells us that they're in trouble. Well, of course, across Australia, between 87 and 90 per cent of the workforce that's dealing with these disasters and emergencies are volunteers. And I'm very interested in Celeste's work, and particularly because the volunteers, for example, in the, C the SES or the CFA, are from their local communities. They're not parachuted in and they know what happens in their communities, the histories, all those sorts of things. And yet volunteerism is declining in Australia. We've had two years of volunteers slowly getting older and leaving, not being able to regenerate and put new volunteers in and learn from the volunteers that have been doing it for 20 or 30 years. So we've got this real leadership problem within the glue within the volunteer base. Basically what COVID did was just strip bare the system. It showed every single weak link in everything we've had from the digital systems like in Gippsland for example there were people without any internet and all of the forms were on the internet that you had to fill out. There was a realisation that there was a, a, a large proportion of our community that were isolating independently uh, without the resources and support services and networks that they'd created throughout their lives. And so once that was removed, there was a real isolation. I know the pandemic has brought a lot of suffering um, to a lot of communities and to the world overall, but it has also showed us that some radical changes are possible. They're not out of the reach. Mm -hmm. And clearly for us as built environment professionals, it's really important to keep on reviewing those 
building codes of practices and standards, etc. Because until now, we've been designing those based on the analysis of past events, of failures, of historical data. But now we really need to take into account something that we don't even understand what it's going to look like. The events are getting more extreme at different ends and generally people are prepared for what they expect. Whereas now we're having events that are unexpected and by the time the next event comes along, they haven't even recovered from the first event. Unfortunately, I mean, we're very good at us as a species of deluding ourselves about uncomfortable truths and a lot of us have chosen to look away. So health is a really important lens and frame for people to begin to understand um, how climate change is here now and personal. And I think one of the problems is that we put people in the centre at the expense of putting our natural environment at the centre and that there is this obvious relationship between people and nature and we need to, to look after each other. We can't assume that people's response will all be the right one and what we're seeing is a, is a, is a, a growth in eco-fascism where people's answer to the climate crisis they experience the climate crisis, but their answer, their solutions are very different than what we, we might expect. Community have their responsibility, but also their accountability. So for me, when we do engagement and we research and we talk to them and we listen to them about what they need, what they want, what's the issues, what's the concerns, um, how is it that CFA can actually help with building those strengths? I guess our ultimate goal engaging in this area of research is to try and as best we can increase the evidence base so that interventions and prevention programs that are out there that exist actually work. Let's thank our panel, uh, Professor Deborah Smith, Dr Cara Dadswell, Professor Zora Wurzel and Celeste Young. Yeah.